Good morning, everyone. I'm Chris, I'm one of the third year residents. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about bombs and blasts. I um, just want to thank everyone on the um, disaster medicine team for helping me put this presentation together. So some objectives for today, I hope to describe the components of pre-hospital planning for MCIs. Um, hope to define the four categories of blast injury, introduce the common um, blast injuries and um, injury patterns, um, explain how to assess bomb and blast casualties, um, and explain the management for blast lung injury. Um, so imagine that you're on a busy CCT shift um, when all of a sudden you hear the CCT um, notification phone ring. Um, you pick it up and EMS replies. EMS says it's EMS with a notification. Um, there were two improvised explosive devices or IEDs hidden in separate backpacks, exploded in separate cars of the park subway train at Atlantic Terminal, five minutes apart. Um, both explosives contain shrapnel. Estimated number of casualties is about 40 patients and the ETA of the first arrivals is about 20 minutes. Um, so as the recipient of this phone call, there are a few things um, you can clarify with EMS. Um, so things to ask about if they didn't already offer include types of explosive. Um, is it a high explosive like C4 or TNT? Um, or is it a low explosive like black powder or smokeless powder? Um, you can ask about if there were any embedded shrapnels, um, if the quantity of explosives, um, the surrounding environments, whether it was in an enclosed or open space because um, injuries tend to be more severe in enclosed spaces. And you can ask about the number of casualties and the age, rate, age, age range of victims. And all this information can help um, you prepare for and predict um, the severity of the incoming disaster. So first I'm gonna be talking about pre-hospital planning. Um, so after you receive the phone call from EMS, there are a few things to think about. Um, one is notification and communication. Next is space supplies and staffing. Third is departmental command and control. Um, and the last is triage and patient managing. Um, so there are no pre-designated roles. Um, so roles should be assigned to uh, whoever is present during the shift. Um, the first role to consider is designating someone to activate the MCI protocol or emergency operations plan. Um, so Dr. Dukas has cheat sheets for both sides of the street for how to activate the MCI protocol. Um, this is the one at Kings County. Um, so you can see there are a few critical actions you should address, um, and it includes notifying AOD to declare the disaster, um, and also notifying our ED admins. And similarly here at UHB, um, you also need to notify AOD to activate the disaster um, and notify our ED admins. Rule number two, um, so you can designate someone to activate and communicate with EOC. Um, so EOC is the Emergency Operations Center. Um, you can think of it as like the central communication hub um, where they coordinate and execute um, disaster management plans. So once EOC is activated, they'll communicate with local agencies like FIDNI, our regional EMS systems, um, and local public health agencies to help um, coordinate disaster responses. You also want someone to communicate the disaster notification um, with our other hospital departments, um, such as the critical care attendings, um, the OR attendings, blood bank, respiratory, radiology, um, and all the other perioperative services. And throughout the entire MCI event, um, there should be continual communication between the ED um, team and um, the EOC and our other hospital departments. Um, you also want someone to assess our hospital's capacity and capabilities. Um, so someone should assess um, how many ED beds we have, how many ICU beds are available, and how many OR beds um, there are. And they should communicate this with the OC to see how many patients we can um, take in from the field and whether or not we need to activate surge protocol. So if we do need to make room for patients, incoming patients, um, we should assess our current patients and then we can rapidly discharge um, non-emergency patients from the ED um, and send admitted patients up to the floor. Um, we can also set up alternate care sites. Um, so for example, we can turn suite, um, suite A at UHB into like the yellow um, urgent treatment zone um, or suite C into the green treatment zone. 
Um, and then you also want to set up support sites um, where volunteers can come, they can donate medical supplies um, and maybe even blood products. And all this can help increase our hospital's capabilities. Someone should also assess our equipment and supplies. Um, this may mean locating our emergency push packs um, and locating our extra stock of airway supplies, such as uh, ventilators, pigtails, um, and chest tubes. So, um, and if people need additional supplies, CDC does have a website um, that you can go to to request additional supplies. And ideally, you should have all these emergency airway equipment and other emergency equipment near the triage or resuscitation area um, for the most emergent patients. And then um, we want to assess our staffing as well. And if we need additional personnel, we should communicate this with the OC and our other hospital departments um, to bring in more uh, personnel. Next, you want to have someone communicate with hospital police um, to divert non-essential vehicles to ensure a smooth flow of traffic. Um, you can set up a media or information center so that there's less clutter and chaos around the triage and treatment areas. And you want to try to restrict patient entry to only the triage area. That brings us to triage. So the most common triage classification system in America is the assigning one of four color-coded tags to the patients. Um, so red is for the most urgent first priority patients who require immediate attention. Um, and usually they'll be, and they should be located to, um, directed to the resuscitation area. Um, yellow is for urgent patients, second priority. Um, these patients usually have injuries with systemic implications or effects, um, and they can usually withstand 45 to 60 minutes of wait time before um, experiencing any uh, immediate risks. And the green tag is for um, less urgent third priority patients who generally, generally are unlikely to deteriorate um, for several hours, if at all. Um, and the black is reserved for dead patients or um, unconscious patients who don't have spontaneous circulation or ventilation. And each of these color-coded tags should have a designated treatment area. Um, so the red can go to the resuscitation area, the yellow can go to a different um, treatment area such as sweet A, um, green, maybe sweet C, and so on and so forth. And there are different triage um, assistance tools out there. Um, this is the BOSS tool. It's a bombing specific triage tool um, and incorporates certain elements such as the patient's ability to ambulate, um, their respiratory rate, their heart rate, their mental status, and takes all this into account to ensure proper triaging. So once a patient is properly triaged, um, our next step is hospital treatments. Um, unlike other forms of trauma, bomb and blast injuries tend to cause more head injuries, um, more multiple injury patterns and multiple sites of injury, uh, making these victims uh, more medically complex and um, challenging compared to other forms of victims uh, and other traumas. Um, so before we go into our patients, um, Keep in mind the different classifications of the different um, blast injuries. So this is a pressure time graph of, of blast wave. So soon after the explosive detonates, um, there's a sharp um, peak in the pressure. Um, this is called the blast over pressure. And then it sharply declines. And this part is called the blast wind where it can propel um, debris and objects into the air. Um, and then there's a short period of negative pressure before the pressure normalizes again. So the blast over pressure from the initial shock wave um, is what causes the primary, um, uh, primary classification of blast injury. Uh, so the pressure can be so strong that it disrupts air liquid interfaces found in our lungs, in our ears, in our GI tracts, and it can lead to damage um, uh, complications such as TM perforation, lung injury, and barrel trauma in our GI tracts. Um, then you have the blast wind, which can cause, um, which can propel debris and objects into the air. 
causing penetrating and blunt trauma um, to our victims. And this is also where you get your shrapnel injuries. Um, and then tertiary injuries are due to um, the blast force displacing our victims. Um, we can throw them into the air um, and slam them against objects um, such as the wall or the ground. And this can also lead to blunt trauma and uh, fractures. Uh, lastly, we have quaternary um, blast injuries, and this pretty much encompasses other injuries that don't fall into the primary, secondary, or tertiary classifications. Um, and it can include smoke inhalation, burns, crush injuries, chemical injuries, and so on and so forth. Um, so patient number one arrives, and keep in mind that although we're just going to be going into two patients, um, multiple people are going to be arriving, so proper triaging is essential to ensuring a, flu, uh, a smooth flow. Um, so patient number one is a man appearing in his 30s, undifferentiated. He was sitting on one of the subway cars where the first IED exploded. Um, he was dragged out by a bystander to a secure location before the second explosion detonated. Um, he's conscious, but states he has trouble hearing your questions. Um, he appears short of breath and cyanotic despite wearing a non rebreather mask. So initial vitals, we have um, a BP of 80 over 50, heart rate 98, 86% on 10 liters, and the patient's tachypnic at 35 breaths per minute. Um, and looking at our BOSS triage tool, although this patient is ambulatory, he is hypoxic and tachypnic. Um, so th this is just a guide, um, but the patient was um, triaged to, uh, was given a red tag and triaged to the resuscitation area. So initial interventions, um, an IV was placed, the patient was continued on oxygen, um, high flow oxygen, and was placed on a monitor. And then primary survey, um, no catastrophic hemorrhage, um, distal pulses were intact, abdomen was soft and non-distended. Um, but the BP remained hypotensive to 80 over 50, so we start some fluids. Uh, for airway, it was intact and patent. Um, patient was phonating, um, no strider or obstruction on oral pharynx inspection. And then for breathing, um, the patient was in marked respiratory distress. Um, he was tachypnic using accessory muscles, um, but you were unable to hear breath sounds um, secondary to background noise. Um, and during the primary survey, a simultaneous EFAS was performed, um, which did not reveal lung sliding over the left side. Um, so we decided to uh, place a needle thoracostomy um, and hooked it up to a chest tube. And whenever an intervention is made, you should reassess the ABCs. Um, so blood pressure is now improved to 97 over 60, um, but the patient now has hemoptysis um, and is still tachypnic and hypoxic despite high flow oxygen. So it was decided to intubate this patient um, using RSI uh, with fracuronium metomidate um, to secure the airway and for impending respiratory failure. Um, and after intubation, patient was stabilized, so we got a portable chest x-ray. Um, and here you can see that there's perihilar um, like butterfly appearance opacity. Um, so that makes us suspect the blast lung injury. And other findings on chest X-ray that can indicate blast lungs include subcutaneous emphysema or pneumomediastinum as well. Um, so we diagnosed our patient with blast lung. Um, blast lung is caused from the primary blast injury. Um, the large pressure from the shock wave can disrupt the air liquid interface um, and cause anatomic disruption. And this can lead to things such as uh, pulmonary hemorrhage, pulmonary contusion, pneumothorax, hemothorax, um, air embolisms, and pneumomediastinum. Um, and sometimes early recognition of this diagnosis um, can be tricky um, given the early benign course. Um, so initially we gave our patient supplemental oxygen um, and you can consider CPAP too, but um, our patient was not stable enough. Um, so we decided to intubate our patient um, and if you're to intubate the patient and put them on a ventilator, um, it's important to use lung protective strategy. Um, so this includes um, giving a low tidal volume, six to eight cc's per kilogram of ideal body weight. You also wanna make sure the plateau pressure is less than 30 centimeters of water. 
um, but you want at least 15 to ensure adequate ventilation. Um, and this is all to uh, prevent further barotrauma um, in the lungs. Um, you can also give um, permissive hypercapnia because a lot of times the low pressures and volumes will cause respiratory acidosis. Um, so you allow them to be um, acidotic um, so that they don't have uh, worsening lung trauma. However, if the patient has failure of oxygenation while on conventional vent, um, so for example, if the patient requires an FiO2 more than 60% for more than four hours, um, you can, um, despite um, proper ventilation, you can consider um, other modalities such as high frequency oscillatory ventilation or ECMO. Um, HFOB is pretty much when you give very small tidal volumes um, at a very high frequency. Um, and this prevents atelectasis and um, barotrauma by working at the mid range of the pressure volume loop. Um, and for patients with blast lung injury, you should also suspect um, and monitor for other forms of um, injuries, such as barotrauma in the intestines. Um, and air embolism is also a common complication uh, of blast lung. So if patients do have um, an air embolism, um, you should position them in the prone um, semi-left lateral or left lateral position. Um, and you can consider transferring them to a hyperbaric chamber. Thanks, Dr. Ross. So um, after a patient was intubated and stabilized, um, just for completion's sake, we do the secondary survey, which show left hemotympanum, um, right conjunctival laceration. Um, there, there's a bunch of penetrating shrapnel wounds over the back, and there's a right lower leg um, fracture. Um, and this is all to show um, just how complex some of these patients are, um, but it's important not to um, be distracted by non-emergency um, injuries. The patient was admitted to ICU and eventually recovered, discharged to rehab. Um, and then we have patient number two who arrived around the same time as patient number one. Um, so this patient is a 50-year-old female. She was seated in one of the subway cars when the blast occurred, throwing her across the enclosure and slamming her against the side of the wall. Um, initially, she was just complaining of some lower leg burning and was triaged as the green card um, for lacerations over the face. Um, however, reassessment one hour later showed um, a change in mental status. Um, so repeat vitals, 130 over 85, heart rate 95, 96% on room air, and respiratory rate of 25. Um, so primary survey, ABCs were intact. Um, and secondary survey um, was notable notable for a change in mental status. Um, so this patient um, is now um, ANO times one with a GCS of 11, um, three for eye opening, three for verbal, um, and five for motor. And then after undressing this patient, you also notice um, deep partial thermal burns over both legs and groin, uh, measuring about 9% total body surface area, um, not including superficial burns. Um, so this is just to show that um, triaging is dynamic, even though this patient um, was initially triaged to green, um, reassessment may show a change in status. Um, so initial interventions, um, IV O2 monitor, um, C-collar is placed and the patient was placed in trendelenburg 
Hertzberg position um, to elevate the head of the bed. Um, and a sterile drape was placed over the burns. And the patient was started on initial, the initial eight hours of um, the Brooks criteria intravenous fluid. Uh, Melpi gave a really great burns lecture uh, last week. Um, and just a reminder that the Brooks and the Parkland is just a way to get started. Um, and you'll need to adjust the maintenance fluids based off the patient's fluid status. And this can be especially tricky in patients with blast injury um, because they have anatomical disruption of their interface. Um, so if they have injuries such as blast lung, um, over resuscitation can cause things like pulmonary edema. Um, and so you should guide fluid resuscitation by urine output, um, their vital signs and respiratory rate. Uh, 15 minutes later, um, patient mental status continues to deteriorate and the patient becomes unconscious. Um, so the patient was intubated um, with fentanyl pretreatment, atomidate and rocuronium. Um, and just a side note, succinylcholine can be given to patients um, with burns less than 24 hours and crush injuries less than seven days. Um, but this team felt, uh, felt safer with rocuronium. So after intubation, um, repeat blood pressure is 115 over 75. Um, and a CT head showed an epidural, epidural hematoma and traumatic subarachnoid, and the patient was admitted to the near ICU um, with communication and burn center. Um, and this short case was just to show the dynamic nature of triaging, and also to show that um, head injuries are more likely in blast um, bomb victims compared to other forms of trauma. Um, I'm just going to end with a few questions. Um, so a patient is intubated and is placed on a ventilator for blast lung. What type of setting would you select? Um, and some of these questions have multiple answers. So I'll just give a few seconds. So it's going to be A, C, and D. Um, so high-frequency ventilation we talked about. Um, you want to make sure the tidal volumes are low enough um, so that they don't um, cause high peak inspiratory pressures and further barotrauma. And you can allow permissive hypercapnia, um, given that these patients will have some component of respiratory acidosis, likely given the small um, tidal volumes and pressures. Yeah, they'll, yeah, lung protective strategy. Um, question number two, what is the appropriate intervention for a patient who presents with kypnea, wheezing, hemoptysis, cough, and chest pain um, following a blast event? So we'll give a few seconds. Uh, so the answer is going to be A, high flow oxygen and judicious um, intravenous fluid replacement. Um, so keep in mind that um, the fluid status for a lot of these patients are tenuous. Um, and a lot of times they may present with other injuries that require um, adequate resuscitation, like crush injuries or burns. Um, but over resuscitation of these patients can cause um, pulmonary edema. Um, so it's important to monitor their fluid status. Question number three, a 40 year old female was found hours after the explosion with her right leg trapped under metal debris. Um, what are possible complications immediately after extrication? So it's going to be um, A, B, C, and D. Um, so when a patient has um, compartment syndrome or crush injuries, it can cause muscle breakdown and, and uh, the lysis of the cells can release potassium and myoglobin CK into the bloodstream. Um, and in high concentrations, this can cause dysrhythmias um, after freeing the limb. Um, these toxins will be released into the bloodstream soon after extrication. And um, soft tissue swelling can prevent placement of IVs um, after extrication. And the kidneys will also be impaired um, from CK and uh, the myoglobin. 
Um, so sometimes if the patient has a pretty severe crush injury um, while in the field, um, they may consider pretreatment prior to extrication, um, such as giving fluids and sodium bicarb to prevent um, these immediate complications after extrication. And the last question, um, which of the following is true regarding compartment syndrome? So I'll give it a few seconds. So the answers are gonna be A, C, and D. Um, so although less common, compartment syndrome can occur in the absence um, of a fracture. Um, and for B, an open fracture does not um, guarantee decompression of the compartments. Um, we know that C is a possible consequence of, of compartment syndrome if we don't address it quickly enough. Um, and we're all taught the five P's of compartment syndrome, pain, pallor, pulselessness, paresthesia, and paralysis. Um, the loss of distal pulses is considered um, a late component of compartment syndrome. And um, you can have a clinical suspicion for compartment syndrome, um, but it's gonna require measurement of the actual compartment pressure to diagnose it. And that's it. Thank you.